Hello guys, it's John from Dr. Mike here, bringing to you today a video about LC or liquid culture, which pretty much everybody, beginner, intermediate, advanced in lycology, has a good idea about what it does. It's an awesome way to multiply your genetics. You can take just a couple of cc's of liquid culture or a small cutting from a petri dish of agar, and you can multiply it to hundreds of LC syringes with little to no effort. But when it comes to LC, there are a lot of variations. There are a lot of requirements for it to be very successful. You want it to proliferate as much as possible. And you also want the mycelium to be well adapted to the sources of nutrition when you shoot it into your grain bag. So depending on what different kind of LC you buy, it can be clear like this, which is our adaptive LC. A little bit less clear like this. This is an Amazon liquid culture. And this is another culture from Amazon, from a Chinese company with a name that doesn't really make much sense in English, but it costs $35 for uh, not very much. You can see there's a huge difference between this and this. As you can see too, it's quite cloudy. Now, a lot of that might clear up by the time it is ready, but this is a much higher sugar content, a much higher protein content than is necessary. In fact, they recommend using four grams per 100 milliliters or 100 grams of water. So to put that in context, anything above 3% sugars in a liquid culture can be toxic to the mycelium and it won't grow. So this is really straddling the lines of what is reasonable. Um, I understand why they're doing it. It's so that they sell you more liquid culture because even if it's a better price for the same amount, you're using four times or twice as much. Um, with our adaptive liquid culture, which we'll talk more about why it's called adaptive here, we only recommend it using 1%. So for this, this is an 800 milliliter mason jar. Um, you use eight grams of LC premix, and that roughly equates to two cents per syringe, all kind of said and done. So that's a really, really decent thing. 50, 50 syringes for $1. So it's definitely a pretty cheap way of doing things. Um, if you're gonna make your own LC at home, you're probably buying caro syrup, peptone from different sources, uh, light malt extract, and also uh, yeast extract, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Um, so they're all differing qualities of stuff that you can add into your liquid culture. Some people, in fact, just use caro syrup because of its clarity, but if you look, at the ingredients of caro syrup, it has a grand total of zero grams of protein and fructose, high fructose corn syrup and regular corn syrup. It's basically just a sugary concoction um, that creates lazy mycelium. And what do we mean by lazy mycelium? Well, mycelium adjusts to the nutrition around them. That's why sometimes when you shoot into a grain bag, you will see proliferation much faster. So that is down to a process called induction. What is induction? Induction is the enzymatic adaptations of the mycelium so that it can better synthesize its environment. So when we look at the basic, the most basic compound which can be readily uh, uptaken by the mycelium in the liquid culture, we're going to look at glucose or dextrose. Um, that is a fantastic compound for growing your liquid culture extremely quickly, but it is metabolized extremely fast. Um, and it will stall out your culture after about six to 10 days, you're gonna be looking at a culture and wondering, huh, what happened here? It's not growing anymore. That's because dextrose, high fructose corn syrup, majority dextrose as well, doesn't have any protein content. It is a fantastic compound though to give the mycelium energy. So it then it ends up being pyruvate and then becomes ATP, which is the same in humans. It gives us the energy to perform our metabolic processes um, and in certain situations, for instance, with lignin, we need simple sugars like dextrose in order to break it down. Because mycelium, if you put it in a medium which is majority lignin, it will not break it down unless it's in the presence of a much more simple sugar to give it the energy. And that's typically to break three plant cell walls to get secondary nutrition. So it takes a bit more energy to do that. It's a lot tougher um, than, than other sugars that it runs into. So let's talk a bit more about carbon sources. So a good liquid culture has three things, carbon sources, protein sources, and trace amounts of, believe it or not, vitamins. 
So when it comes to carbon sources, we just talked about dextrose, that's readily broken down. You can have much more complicated sugars and starches involved. In our adaptive liquid culture, we have malt extract, which is maltose, and then we also have what's called maltodextrin, which is created through chemical washing of the starch on the outside of grains. Now why is maltodextrin, which is literally two dextrose together, a good sugar to use? And we say sugar, it is definitely sugar. The USDA, because it doesn't have a sweet taste, they say, oh no, this isn't sugar, but it's got a massively high glycemic index. It is sugar, it's processed as a hydrocarbon, it's processed as sugar, and it creates ATP just like the other stuff. But it does take a little bit longer for it to get broken down. So while the dextrose is being assimilated, when it gets to a lower level, the maltodextrin and the light malt extract will also be utilized and broken down. So the dextrose gives everything a really good head start, and then the more complicated sugars and starches end up giving it a secondary boost, which will allow it to grow more in the six to 10 day period. During that time also, it starts to break down more of the protein sources. So Saccharomyces cerevisiae, brewer's yeast, we use that. We use a very, very high quality standardization of brewer's yeast. It's 90% RNA, which means it's more than 50% by dry weight, supremely soluble. So you get a lot of protein for your bang for your buck. Um, if you're just buying regular brewer's yeast off Amazon, it's not being particularly well processed, and you'll see cloudy sedimentation at the bottom of the jar. Not the case with ours, as you can see here. It's an extremely clear solution. Um, it works very, very well. The third thing that we didn't touch on yet is vitamins. So we add trace amounts of thiamine monohydrate. The great thing about thiamine, it gives the mycelium the ability to break down other things and to create enzymes and cofactors which are necessary for life. So it allows for biotin, B7, to carbox, well, what's called carboxylation. There's dehydrogenation as well, uh, pyroxidin for transamination. There are lots of different enzymatic actions that need a underpinning. They need the vitamins there to be performed efficiently. So we add trace amounts of thiamine monohydrate, which is something which, again, you're not going to find in your caro syrup. You're probably not going to find it in your cheap, or not cheap, but ineffective Chinese liquid culture premixes or regular mixes. It's very important to have. Um, so anyway, I'll move these to the side here and we'll talk about the largest component of liquid culture by weight, which is water. So this here you can see, extremely clear, this is distilled water with our adaptive liquid culture. So this is 800 milliliters, it means it has 8 grams of adapted liquid culture. Uh, this is 8 grams of adaptive liquid culture in tap water. And what we're going to do today is show you the difference between tap water and distilled water because there's a huge difference in the carrying capacity of the water which ultimately ends up giving you a crystal clear liquid culture or it can bring sedimentation which obviously some people get annoyed about because if you're spending money on a liquid culture you want it to be perfect and our adaptive liquid culture we believe is fantastic at driving these enzymatic adaptations which will make your cultures extremely efficacious when you shoot it to grain um, but it does need to be in the correct water or water with the correct carrying capacity to have the best results so bear with us we're gonna throw these in the pressure cooker here in the well we're gonna sterilize them in our autoclave um, and you'll see the difference between regular water and distilled or RO water Hey guys, welcome back. Uh, we just finished our cycle and we left the jars to cool a little bit so that they were cool enough to touch. And you can see there is a huge difference between the distilled water and the tap water. This doesn't look particularly great. Lots of liquid cultures are this color, but it's pretty hard for most people to imagine that the content of both of these was exactly the same besides there being a difference in water type. So not only do they look completely different, there's a lot more clarity in this, so over time this will create some sedimentation at the bottom, but also the pH of the uh, solutions is also considerably different. So we'll just dip them here. Our battery pH tester is playing up today, so we're gonna do it with these strips. You'll be able to see 
there was a huge difference in the pH. So the distilled water solution has a pH of around 4 to 4.5, which is optimal for starting out growing mycelium, especially dung loving mycelium, which is what this particular liquid culture was designed for in liquid culture. This, on the other hand, is close to a neutral pH. So typically what we see in the growth cycle of mycelium as a submerged culture is the pH will stay the same, close to the same, up until about the eighth day in solutions that have a large amount of glucose. If there's less glucose in the solution, the pH will start to rise earlier than that. But typically the eighth to 10th day, we'll see the pH raise from 4, 4.5, all the way up to a pH of eight. And on the ninth day, that's typically when you have the maximum amount of dry weight of mycelium relative to what you could have within the culture. And that's a fantastic day to harvest it. Um, so obviously, Glucose is an interesting addition. Obviously, we put a lot of it in there, and we've explained that earlier. But in early studies, uh, looking at psilocybin in submerged liquid culture, they found that if you do not include glucose, there will be no alkaloid production at all. No measurable alkaloid production. But the liquid culture will only grow to 10% of the dry weight that it would in that particular culture if glucose was included. So it's an extremely interesting and obviously extremely important addition to have in your liquid culture. Um, also available phosphate too had an appreciable effect on um, the alkaloid production of the liquid culture. If there was low phosphate, um, that created a rapid change in pH and also a rapid decrease in alkaloid content around the eighth day. So phosphate is an extremely interesting addition or takeaway as well. Um, tryptophan didn't really have much of a difference in the studies that I've read to, so we don't include tryptophan in here. Um, what can make a big difference, however, in how you process your liquid culture is the kind of lid that you use. Um, here you can see one of our cultures, the jar is completely full. Um, this here is a lid that has been made to pull very easily. You can unscrew the cap, which I'm not going to do because we're not in a laminar flow environment. And you can pull out the mycelium. You can pull out the uh, syringes one by one, which is much easier than the old way, which was literally just an injection port. And you would stick the needle in, and then you would screw on the law connector and pull them out one by one. This isn't an incredibly efficient design. This here is much, much better. Um, we are also working on a new fancy lid here for pulling LC where you can literally screw in the IV syringe air filters underneath and unscrew them. Um, this also has a concave top which allows water to flow away from any of the orifices and will have a built-in bulkhead so that again you can use this sort of an apparatus when you're pulling the liquid culture out. Another consideration is obviously how many times you kind of spin the magnetic stir bar or the marble to break everything up and to aerate the water. So there was an interesting study that looked at Fernbach flasks versus Erlenmeyer flasks. And Fernbach flasks are much larger, typically two and a half to five liters. Uh, Erlenmeyer flasks, the ones that we use are 500. And they found that there was a substantial larger amount of growth in the Fernbach flasks with no appreciable differences in the actual culture media, which is fascinating. You wonder why that is. Well, it, it appears to be that the amount of air exchange that goes on drastically affects the growth of the mycelium. So we want to make sure that the cultures are getting aerated every day or every other day to really break everything up and to make the water have the right oxygen saturation, carbon dioxide levels too. So that is a very interesting point. Um, we're obviously using these right now, these jars, but you can get a much faster growth rate if you have a larger jar with a smaller amount of liquid culture in it, you just won't grow as much liquid culture. Most people prefer to have a four jar anyway. Another um, important point to mention, and this pertains to agar as well as to liquid culture too, um, when you're sterilizing under pressure, there is an equalization that happens where the, boi the boiling point changes along with the pressure. So if you're cooking these in a pressure cooker and you have the lids cracked, which you need to do, and we won't use this yucky color one because this one. If you have the lids cracked so that the pressure gets into the jar, 
what will happen if you're not careful, if it cools down too quickly, your liquid culture itself will boil um, as the, dyna the dynamics within the uh, pressure vessel don't allow for it to cool quickly enough relative to the boiling point. So then you'll end up losing a bunch of your liquid culture. So we recommend leaving, if you're doing it in like a presto pressure cooker, you can just decrease the temperature of the pressure vessel slowly. And as you do that, there's much less a chance of it boiling over as well. So that kind of covers most of what we wanted to talk about with the liquid culture. Thank you guys very much for tuning in. Uh, appreciate all your support. Uh, we'll put a link in the notes of this episode to our website and to any other information that we have pertinent to this. Um, we obviously really appreciate everybody's business and everybody's time tuning into our content. Let us know if there's anything else that you would like to hear about. Um, have a great week and we will catch you soon. Bye-bye.